Shalom, Shana Tova, a happy and healthy new year for all of us. This year is really special and Rosh Hashanah is not an exception because the year that we are in and we just started starts with the first day on Shabbat. And as you may know, and you may have heard, Shabbat is the day of resting, but also a day when in Rosh Hashanah, we do not blow the shofar. So we have to wait until the second day of Rosh Hashanah, Sunday, to hear the sound of the shofar. So I wanted to review with you, to learn together about the shofar a little bit. Where does the shofar appear for the first time in the Torah? How many times the shofar, the word shofar appears in the whole Bible? And then navigate a little bit throughout the story of the shofar and the different functions, the different ways we the Jewish people have used the shofar in different instances of our lives. So let me start by saying that the shofar appears in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, 63 times. So what can we do with that information? Well, first of all, I want to say that it's a good number. Some people may think that the shofar, the word shofar may appear just scattered and very few times in throughout the Bible. And some other people will may, may have thought maybe the shofar is present many more times. So 63 is a nice number. And I think uh, in some ways it's a number that is expected from uh, someone who have read the Tanakh to appear the word shofar in the Torah, in the whole Bible. So now to the question, when is the first time that the word shofar appear, appears in the Tanakh or in the whole Bible? I'm sure you will not be surprised to learn that the shofar appears for the first time. First time that the word shofar appears is in Ma'amad al-Sinai, in the revelation in Mount Sinai. So we read as follows. In Exodus 19, Verse 16. Exodus 19, 16. On the third day, as morning dawned, there was thunder and lightning and a dense cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud blast of the horn, shofar, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. So the first appearance of the word shofar happens when the people of Israel receive the Torah. There's a beautiful Midrash that tells us that even in the moment of creation, the sound of the shofar was heard. So yes, in the Bible, we will find the shofar in Mount Sinai, but in the Midrash, we will find it much earlier in time, in the time of creation. What does it teach us? So I want to point out to three concepts of Judaism that uh, are main, central, that are you know, crucial to understand who we are. The first one is creation. So we have the shofar in the time of creation as the Midrash says. The second term is revelation. And it is in Mount Sinai when we hear the shofar. And the last sound of the shofar, or the, maybe the one that we are waiting to hear, is in redemption. So we will find the shofar last time, or with a message for the last time, at the in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 27, 13 says, Bayo <speaking in Hebrew> makes a beautiful song so it, I hope I did not uh, make you turn off the computer now with my song but in any case the prophet Isaiah says on that day a good a huge shofar sound will be sound and the tribes the people who are lost, 
in the land of Assyria will return and those who stayed in Egypt will come back and they will prostrate to God in the Mount, in the Eretz Behar Kodesh, in the Holy Mountain in Jerusalem. So, the redemption, the day when the Messiah will come and we will be all regathered in Jerusalem is the climax of the sound of the shofar. And in fact, that is another analogy, another coincidence, another point of contact with our story of the shofar in the story of Abraham that we just read. We hear that in the ram that was caught with one horn uh, the, is the sound of the shofar that we hear every year in Rosh Hashanah. But the other horn of the ram will be used when uh, the Messiah will come. That's the story of Abraham finding the ram after the binding of Isaac. But there are other ways that the shofar has been used throughout the Jewish history. As I mentioned, you know that the main story of Rosh Hashanah deals with the binding of Isaac and Abraham finding that uh, isle, of course, that, that uh, uh, ram, but it's not mentioned the word shofar, it's just mentioned the keren, be'ine isle nechas basbach be'karnav, it was caught, the, the ram with the horns. The second time that the word shofar appears in the Tanakh, in the Bible, it's in the book of Leviticus. And it says as follows on Leviticus 23, 24. Speak to the Israelite people and tell them in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a complete, re a complete rest a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. So, which was, which is the seventh month, remember, in bi biblical times, the first month was the month of Nisan. So if we start counting from the month, uh, month of Nisan, it's Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, Tammuz, Av, Elul, and the seventh month is Tishrei. So the first day of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah, that's how we count nowadays, no, like we did in biblical times. In Rosh Hashanah, we need to rest, but hear the sound of the shofar. Another way to use the shofar, another function of the shofar was also found two chapters later in the book, in the book of Leviticus. It says, Be'avarta shofar trua v'chodesh ashvi v'asor l'chodesh v'yom ha'kipurim ta'aviru shofar v'chol arzehem. So, on the tenth day, you should, you should sound the horn very loud. In the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement in Yom Kippurin, you shall have the horn sounded throughout your land. We blow the shofar on Yom Kippur? Yes, back in the time, in the Jubilee year, in the 50th year, when the people of Israel had to return their lands to the original owners, the shofar will be sounded all over Israel to know that this year is the Yobel, the Jubilee, and therefore the lands goes to the original owners so every single tribe will be able to preserve the amount of land and it will not be unbalanced not the tri tribe of judah will have more land than the tribe of manashe and they will be able to keep that balance uh, among the israelites then later in the book of joshua we found that as you may recall the book of joshua tells us about the conquering of the land of israel and here comes a beautiful story about the conquering of Jericho, Jericho, that you can still visit nowadays in Israel, hopefully. And uh, that uh, place was conquered in a special way. For seven days, there was a siege around the city. It was a walled city. And it says as follows. Beshiva koanim isu shiva shofarot ayoblim lifnei aron on the seventh day, seven priests will carry a shofar and they will go around the city and blow the shofar. And what happened then? The walls of Jericho fell down after this, this priest who had great lungs were able to blow the shofar while surrounding the city for seven times. Maybe that's a connection there with Simcha's Torah. Maybe. 
and for seven days they were uh, sieging around the city and on the seventh day seven priests did seven circles blowing the shofar uh, all the time and the walls fell down and the Israelites were able to conquer the city of Jericho. So that's another way to use the shofar, to destroy the walls. We can see that also the shofar was used to call for a war or to come back and return and announce that the war was over and we uh, defeated our enemies in, in battle. So the, the story of, of Jericho and Joshua includes the word shofars several times, but also in the book of Judges, the book that comes after that. There's, there was a judge called Gidon. He fought against the Midianites and he did not only gather seven Kohanim, he gathered 300 people to blow the shofar and scare away the Midianites and defeat the Israel in enemies. So that can be found also in the book of Judges. 722, they blew 300 shofarot. Then the shofar has another function. In the book of Samuel, when King David, one of my favorite books, as you may know, when King David returns the ark into Jerusalem, triumphant, he is happy, dancing. It says, Be David behol Beit Israel, Malin et Malim et Aronad Hashem, Bitruau bekol shofar. So they were bringing back, announcing that the ark was returned to Jerusalem to make it make. Jerusalem, the main city of uh, Israel, the capital, and they were blasting the shofar. Later, in the book of Kings, here's King Solomon. He's becoming a king. He is being uh, anointed as a king. And it says, Umashach oto sham tzadok ha-kohen. Tzadok, the high priest, will, uh, um, Mashach will make him uh, the anointed one. Benatan, Benatan and Abi, le Melech Israel. Also, Nathan the prophet will anoint Solomon as the king over Israel. Utkatem be shofar be amartem yehi amelech Shlomo. And you should blow the shofar and say, "Long life to the king Solomon." Very good. So we hear that the shofar has several different functions and we use it in many different ways and as I told you in the book of Isaiah on the last day the, the Messiah will come and be announced with the sound of the shofar. So the question is which shofar should we blow and I know you you know that there are different shofars and I explained that also in one of the videos for Elul I hope you saw it uh, as a preparation for Rosh Hashanah that we can use any shofar that is from a kosher animal but not from a cow because it reminds us of the sin of the golden calf. So now I want you, I wanted to share with you that a part that says in that uh, appears in Masechet Rosh Hashanah in the Talmud. It says, says Rabbi, Rabbi Abau, why do we blow the shofar with the horn of a ram? And it says, said the Holy One. Blow before me a ram's horn in order that I remember for you the binding of Isaac, son of Abraham, and I will consider it as if you bound yourself before me. So we try to use a, a ram's horn because it reminds us of the Akedat Yitzchak. Very nice. So now I have a question. I started saying that it's a special year because we don't blow the shofar on Shabbat. You may think, well, Rabbi, explain us. Why don't we blow the shofar on Shabbat? And you may create an answer for yourself, or you may think that the main answer is that blowing the shofar is a big effort, and blowing the shofar is like a job or a task that requires a lot of energy, and therefore Shabbat is a day of rest. And that's the main reason. But I want to tell you that that's not what the Talmud tells us. The Talmud in Rosh Hashanah 29b says, Rabbah said, all are under obligated to blow the shofar, 
but not all are skilled in blowing the shofar. Everybody needs to hear the sound of the shofar. It should be blowing the shofar. But not everybody knows how to blow the shofar. Therefore, says the Talmud, there is a danger that one will take the shofar and go to an expert to learn how to properly sound it. And he or she will carry the shofar four cubits in the public domain. That is an act that is forbidden on Shabbat. So the Torah is putting a fence. It's making a siag. Our sages are saying, in case you don't know how to blow the shofar, you will want, you are tempted, you, you have an obligation. So you may take your shofar and carry it and go to your shofar lesson, to your shofar teacher. And you are not supposed to carry the shofar from the a, a private domain into the public domain. That's a prohibition on Shabbat. You cannot carry. That's why we have an Eruv. But not every city had an Eruv. Not every city had a, a place where you can carry your stuff. Therefore, in just to prevent that you may incur in the possibility of carrying on Shabbat, we don't blow the shofar on Shabbat. That's something interesting. The rabbis were very careful with the observance of Shabbat. And also, I must say that the rabbis did not have Netflix. So they created a lot of uh, alachot and a lot of rules in order to prevent us from doing certain things that they may not make a lot of sense nowadays. Because blowing the shofar, I can tell you, it's something that we all want to hear. And also, especially on Shabbat, uh, it's not a big effort. We do other things that may require more efforts, but we still respect what the rabbis did and decreed back in the time in order to respect the Shabbat. And it makes, makes sense and made sense back in the times as well. But the shofar still has a connection with the Shabbat. And let me share with you a small piece of the Talmud in Shabbat 35b, the Babylonian Talmud, it says, our rabbis taught six blasts were blown on the eve of Shabbat. So the shofar was blown before the Shabbat started. The first sound for people to cease work in the fields. So people were working in the fields. So they heard the sound of the shofar. This first sound was to remind them to stop working. Why? They were far away. So they had to go back on time to come back and get ready for Shabbat. The second sound of the shofar the city and the shops sits to work. So if you have, a, a, I don't know, a fruit shop or a vegetable shop in the city, you need to close the curtain and get ready for Shabbat. That was the second. The third, for the lights to be kindled, kindled so, or kindled, sorry. So the third sound of the shofar reminds us that it's time to light the candle. If you've been to Jerusalem, and other places in Israel, before Shabbat, you hear a siren that says, Ooh! so it's everybody knows that it's time to blow the shofar. And to be honest, you know, in on Friday, every single newspaper has the time when we light candles on Shabbat and uh, it comes in the news and this, stuff. but still the people want to hear that sound because that announced us and reminds us back in the time when they blew the shofar to get ready for a Shabbat. I said six blow, six sounds of the shofar before Shabbat. So Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said, the third is for the tefillin to be removed. That's very interesting. That's not a custom that we hold nowadays in, in here in America, but still the minag, the custom in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem, is to wear the, the tefillin all day long. So it's not just in the morning, they put on tefillin and they carry them all day long as a reminder of being liberated from Egypt. They carried it all day long and the Israelites or the Jews were uh, reminded to remove the tefillin before Shabbat because on Shabbat we don't wear the tefillin. So uh, how long was the interval between the sounds of the shofar? The, Mishnah, the Talmud says there was an interval for as long as it takes to bake a small fish or to put a loaf in the oven. So they measured the time by uh, the time it took 
to uh, bake a fish. They didn't have Alexa or Siri to help to help them to uh, set the timer. So now uh, we know where it comes the siren sound that comes from Jerusalem. So I like to to share with you other things about about uh, the shofar, and I hope uh, you continue with me uh, throughout this. Uh, learning session to, together so here we have several sounds of the shofar are blown in rosh hashanah so it is customary to blow 100 sounds of the shofar and to be honest uh, the minimum is not 100 this is one of the customs 100 but the original sound of the shofar as you may remember was shalosh shel shalosh shalosh so it was the minimum it says uh, in the Torah requires that three truot, three tekiot, and three shevarim. So the number nine will be the minimum. But later, the our sages started to interpret that. And in the third century, Rabbi Avau of Caesarea, of Caesarea, the city where Bibi Netanyahu has uh, his private home, and it's a beautiful city also, Three sets of tekia, terua, tekia. He says, be repeated three times. Each time with a different type of terua, because there was a doubt if terua and shevarim were the same sound or not. Long story short, this rabbi in the third century says that the minimum should be 27 sounds. Later, we move from 27 to 30. So the... Um, Rabbi Asher Ben Yehiel, also known as the Rosh, he, he lived in Spain in the 13th century. He is the one who establishes the minimum of 30th blast because he distinguished between Shevarim and Truah if this it, it's still one sound or two sounds. I don't want to uh, drive you crazy with all this alahot, but nowadays we consider that the minimum, everybody agrees that the minimum number of sounds of the shofar are 30 sounds of the shofar and that's what we have in in our mahzor and many mahzorim the one that uh, i used to you to use in in argentina in south america then listen to these crazy different customs then from 30 some people move it to 40 then to 42 and everyone has the reasons to do that then to 60 then to 61 then to 100 and 100 is probably the number that some people agree. Uh, the way to do it is 30 after the Torah service, 30 during the silent Amida of Musaf, 30 during the repetition of Musaf, and the last 10, <clears throat> excuse me, is after the Kaddish Tid Kabel. In, in, after we say Tid Kabel, or be, sorry, before we say Tid Kabel in the Kaddish Alem at the end of, of the a service of Musaf. There are 10 more blasts that end with the Tekiyak Dola, so we can make the 100 sounds of the shofar. So where does the 100 sounds of the shofar come from? That's a good question. So it says as follows. There's a great story. The story that uh, I want to share with you is the story of uh, Sisra. I hope you remember who Sisra was. If you don't remember, I'm going to tell you. There was a a prophet, a female prophet, her name was Devora, and she had some enemies in the book of Shoftim, in the book of Judges, on on the on the chapter number five, verse twenty-eight. So Sisra uh, and Deborah went on, on war, and Sisra started to escape. And when uh, Sisra was escaping, there was a woman. Who invited him to hide in her tent. Her name was Yael, and Yael gave to Sisra some uh, dairy products, milk and cheese for him to be to be calm down and relax. And Sisra fell asleep. And when Sisra fell asleep, Yael, who was a descendant from Etro, from the Canaanites, uh, the Canaanim in Hebrew, uh, Yael killed Sisra, and that gave. Uh, the Israelites a big victory. So the Talmud says as follow. In 
the Tractate of Rosh Hashanah. Ve'atanya shi'ur trua ke shlosha shvarim. The length of a trua is equal to the length of three yevavot. Yevava is a number, it's the same word as the word shevarim. So, ama, amar abaye, shi'ur trua ke shlosha yevavot. The ipli gidiktiv yom trua yelachem, umetargeminam yom yevava yelechon, uchti beimei de sisra, beada halon ishkafa bateibab em sisra. Mar sabar. Ganuja y Ganaj, Umar Sabar, Yelule, Yelil. So let me translate that from the Aramaic. The length of a true, a true is equal to the length of three Yevabot. But it has been taught the length of a true is equal to three Shevarim. Abaye said, There is really a difference of opinion. It is written, It shall be a day of true for you. And we translate that statement into the Aramaic and say, a day of Yebaba, of wailing, and it's written of the mother of Sisra. Throughout the window she looked forth, but Teibab, and she wailed. One authority thought that it means that she was wah, 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 crying like this, and there was the other authority thought that she was crying like wah, wah, wah. she was crying to see uh, this uh, Sisra, her son, killed. So. From the word Yevaba, the sound that she was creating, and we learned that she cried one handed cries. <coughs> Excuse me. So from that, we learned that we inferred that since this brought a victory to the Israelites and she cried one handed cries, we should be sounding one hundred sounds of the shofar. So that is the uh, Ashkenazi custom and it was a connection between the word Trua and Yebaba and since Sisra cried one, the mother of Sisra cried 100 times, we blow the shofar 100 times. The Sephardic communities have one, of course, one different custom and they, instead of blowing 100, 100 sounds, they blow one 101, 101. And I'm going to read to you. Among the communities that follow the Sephardic rite, an additional tekia is sound bef just before the Aleinu at the end of Musaf, making a total of 101 blasts. Some say that it corresponds to the numerical value of the letters of the name Michael. Michael, Israel's guardian angel. Others suggest that it's in order to confuse the Satan that we are, that the Sephardic people add one more blast. So, as you may see, there are different customs about the shofar. So, I want to tell you two more things about the shofar. The last one, or the one before the last one, is one custom that I learned. And some people uh, blew the shofar in in funerals. And why was that? Uh, it's not a very uh, present custom. We don't follow that custom, and I don't. I hear that it's not done anymore. But uh, the reason is for to call the people to uh, that the relatives of the person that is being buried will not carry the sins or the uh, not very good ways that the person that is being buried and uh, has been forgiven all the sins will not be transpassed to uh, the next generations, which I found uh, an interesting connection to these days of Rosh Hashanah. When we do repentance, we uh, consider again our acts in the previous year, and we ask God that we will be inscribed in, in the Book of Life. And one more thing that uh, is a shofar that brings a lot of happiness wh whenever we remember this episode is the shofar of the Rabbi Goren, Rav Goren. Rav Goren was the, became the chief rabbi of, rabbi of Israel, and he is the one who blew the shofar uh, in the old city of Jerusalem when the Israelites recovered, uh, when the Jewish people recovered the um, old city of Jerusalem, and he blew the shofar on the Western Wall. You may recall the picture of the rabbi blowing the shofar, but there's one more story about this rabbi and not a very well-known story. We all 
heard that he blew the shofar there. But according to a story that goes around, after he blew the shofar, he said, okay, if we recover Jerusalem, we should go and uh, do the same with Hebron, where Me'arat HaMachpeilah, the cave of the patriarchs, are. So he, after he blew the shofar and they said Sheheyanu in the Kotel, he rode on his jeep by himself, thinking that all the army, the Israeli army, will go there immediately. When he arrived to Hebron, he saw that many of the uh, Arab people who were there had um, hanged white sheets in their in their balconies, in their windows. They were surrendering because they were hearing the news that uh, the Israeli army in 67 was uh, becoming strong and had recovered Jerusalem. And he went into the city thinking that the army was already there to find out that he was alone there. And he conquered the whole city by himself. He recovered the city of Hebron only by himself. He went straight into Me'arata Machpelah, to the cave of Machpelah, and he blew the shofar where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our forefathers, and uh, Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah are buried there. And according to the Midrash, also Adam and Eve are buried there as well. And he blew the shofar that day in the cave of the patriarchs. Later, the rest of the army arrived, but it's a story that uh, the Rav uh, Goren conquered a whole city by himself. I hope this uh, lesson and this time of study had brought you a different idea, different knowledge about the shofar. I hope the sound of the shofar is inspiring, has been inspiring and continue being inspiring and that we will be able to conquer ourselves to become better people in this year that uh, started and that we always meet in happiness. Shana Tova Umetuka. Many blessings for you.